It's Toronto's podcast on the Canada's Podcast Network. Today, I'd like to introduce Anthony De Cristofaro. Fortunately for me, he's a friend of mine. I'm excited to have him as a fantastic entrepreneur. Anthony is currently president and CEO of QNext and has over 25 years of computer industry experience. In his career, he has driven three M&A transactions valued at over 600 million, which is one heck of an achievement. Anthony was also present CEO of IC Media, co-founder and CEO of NGI Software, where he actually brought Intel in as an investor. He co-founded that in 1996, and he sold it to Roxio in 2002. Prior to MGI, Anthony was a founding board member of Delrina and VP GM of AST Computer and NEC Canada. As I said, I've known Anthony and worked as an advisor to him for many years. But Anthony, let's start off. Tell us a little bit more about you. Where you're from? You know, give us the details uh, of your current business. Just five minute intro into who the heck Anthony De Cristofaro is. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, so a couple of things. One is uh, I was born in Toronto. Uh, parents were Italian, so I got to. Uh, I got to learn a lot of things about uh, good food, and uh, I started my uh, the beginning of the focus of, of my career in the engineering side. So I, I graduated from uh, DeVry Institute, very focused on engineering, and uh, interestingly enough, um, I got out of my uh, out of my uh, first job, which was really I guess at a desk, and analyzing circuits. <laughs> so that's where the world began for Anthony de Cristofaro. And I was enamored and loved the technology sector. And so um, that's where basically I got my foothold into what I call my first step, my first job. Um, graduating, um, I did a little, uh, a little extra where typical um, students wouldn't, and that would be that uh, as soon as I graduated, I graduated. Uh, there was a couple of people at the top that were offered a job to go to Texas and then to do a stint in Saudi Arabia for approximately a year and a half. So I was in the middle of the desert helping um, Litton Systems record data uh, um, with uh, with a team. So it was quite a interesting. Uh, initial uh, exit from engineering school to uh, to a global uh, global opportunity with uh, learning these cultures around the world. Okay, great. The next thing I, I ask us of everybody, but can you tell us? You know, you, you started working like we all do, but you know, what was your stop moment when you decided? You know, you really wanted to become an entrepreneur which is something different than working, say, at Lytton as an employee in, in, you know, in the Middle East. Uh, what, what, yeah. what took you, what grabbed you? Kind of thing? Well, I, I guess before I, get, uh, I got to that step, um, you know, as anybody usually does, and they graduate and they have a certain focus and passion, and mine originally was engineering, was that, you know, I got back to Canada, um, got a little opportunities to be a little more entrepreneurial where I, I started up MicroPro and WordStar in Canada. But most important of all, I thought I wanted to be in the corporate world to test my my skills, both both corporately, both as an individual. And I realized over time from engineering, I wanted to get into product management and that's what happened with my career. And from product management, I got into marketing. And from marketing, I got into sales. And ultimately, with those pieces behind me and confidence, um, I started a subsidiary uh, called NEC Corporation. And I got the opportunity to, to have and be the general manager and setting up NEC, which had, of course, the multi-sync monitors and the notebooks and all these other world-class products to set up their subsidiary, build a team and make it successful. And we were very successful. And uh, 
and then after NEC, once I had that that kind of bite where all of a sudden I felt like, wow, I can build a team, I can uh, go against the best, you know, in the industry with a great team, and you know, grab our market share, grab our revenue. Um, I was given an opportunity to basically set up what's called AST Computer, and at the time they were. Um, probably doing about 18 to 20 million dollars and we quickly within approximately three three years uh, three and a half years went from 18 million to close to 400 million so at that point in time we were doing um, the equivalent of 20 percent of worldwide revenue of AST out of California out of just Canada normally it's you know any any business person or entrepreneur would know that typically uh, Canadian sales are about 10% of US sales we were 20% of worldwide sales so we had an amazing team uh, built it great marketing great positioning um, became number two in the Canadian PC market next to Compaq and we were actually ahead of IBM and so uh, with that tremendous amount of sales, I was offered a position um, in the United States to run Americas, which was about a billion dollars. And uh, I declined. And, and to answer your question, Phil, that was the point where I said, you know, I've worked for companies, built um, some very successful uh, uh, organizations with, uh, with incredible team players. Uh, that we had as as people and I said at that point in time I had an opportunity to either stay in the corporate world or get out in a way on my own and I was offered um, through uh, through an individual which became my my partner a co-founder of a company called MGI software which was Orrin Asher who had pieces of software but kind of had to find a place, a market, a strategy, and, um, and um, you know, building a team for execution. So that's when I really said, okay, it's time for me to kind of do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my first foray into saying, wow, I, you know, I've got no paycheck immediately, and now I've got to go out and raise money. Uh, have a product, get a strategy, and figure out how I'm going to conquer this little slice in the world of, of uh, this segment so, of business. So let's, so let's take that. So here, here you are. Uh, as I said, I'm fortunate. I know Anthony, and I was kind of around around that during those times. But you, you and Oren gotten together. You said, okay, we're going to focus on building a business. You need, you know, you run into that scenario where lots of entrepreneurs do. You had great ideas, you had great concepts, but you needed financing to start your company. And I know that's something you've been involved in, but that was just at the beginning. How did that materialize? How did you get it? Maybe you can help people understand that a similar position, you know, the kind of surge it takes to to get external financing. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and, and to answer a little bit of your question, I, I started in engineering. So for me, it was important to have that fundamental understanding for me to say, from an engineering perspective, I can understand what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what may be a possibility. I also knew at that time, which all these entrepreneurs, if they're listening to this podcast, is you've got to do what you love to do. And as much as I know, that being an engineer and being on a bench and testing things was really ultimately not what I wanted to do. As I got the bite into marketing and sales said that I can bring these pieces together and just be more of a, a, a force and more of a value add to, to the, uh, you know, to, to this marketplace. So to really answer your, your question, the, the key is all about passion. So a, you have to have the passion for what you see and what you believe in. You have to be strategic. One, a lot of the statistics when I was certainly started MGI, software was nine out of 10 software companies do not make it, and one out of 10 do. 
the statistics may be a little bit better now, but they're probably in and around that that segment. So uh, very important to have a methodical focus is so important. Every company has got to stay focused on their market, on their messaging, on their segment, and they got to believe in it and they've got to see the, the, you know, the progress happening. So I, I guess to answer your, your question at the end of the day, you got to have that passion and belief yeah. in so exactly good. what you're doing. Cause that is ultimately what helps you raise money and people out there who are waiting for the pitch, they will sense exactly how passionate, how committed and how confident you are in the ideas and the, the business or the segment you're going after and why you're going to be successful. That's great stuff. But I'm interested to know, you know, what, what's a typical day look like for you? How do you maintain the kind of focus that you know it needs to succeed and have fun, you know, every day? Is there a process that you can pass on to people in terms of, you know, how that works for you? that you think they, that they may, may learn? Yeah, so I, I would say, uh, to answer your question on a typical day, and whether it's QNEXT or it was MGI in the beginning, is again about A, laying out some plan in your, in your mind to say the focus of what are the key milestones you want to achieve for this company. What are they? I mean, you should be able to put it on one piece of paper and say in the next you know, while this is what I want to accomplish. And what that does at the end of the day is give you now, when you have that goal and that piece of paper and these, you know, key areas and points you want to achieve, then you drive back from that and say, okay, what do I got to do to achieve those four or five key points for the company this year? And then you get into the more of the micro detail of, you know, I'm going to need an individual for this. I'm going to have to go out and start talking to these large companies and here's my positioning and all that relates to trying to accomplish the significant, you know, milestones of a company that will allow you to a build value and B give you the opportunity then to have more access to more cash. So, Th thinking about, I mean, I know that you have tons of experience on the international front, but this is a, this is sort of Canada's podcast and specifically Toronto's podcast. So, what are the biggest benefits for you uh, about being an entrepreneur in Toronto? You know, why here? You could be anywhere. To be in Italy, for goodness' sake, you know. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'd enjoy the lifestyle in Italy. Um, I don't know how much we would accomplish, but uh, we would so definitely enjoy it. But I think, you know, uh, it's a good question. I mean, listen, the best impact would be being in the valley. But then you say to yourself, okay, you know, you've got to make certain decisions, A, about your experience and the talent you have and, you know, where are they? And then you had say to yourself, okay, if I'm not in the Valley, let's say I'm in Toronto. Uh, let's say I'm in a suburb called Concord. So, and I got the greatest software product in the world. In this segment, I believe I have the best. So how do you conquer the world? The entire world, how do you do it? You're sitting in Concord with a little piece of software. You got a great little team. And now somebody's telling you, and you're getting some of these investors who are investing in you and they are investing money, believing you have the opportunity to conquer the world. So now comes the other side, which is all comes down to the entrepreneur and the CEO and the guy in charge is that, you know, how am I going to conquer the world from here? There's the first thing I do is, you know, and I will tell everybody who's listening is that the world is California and Silicon Valley is a big, big, big influence segment that in many ways sometimes has to be conquered to get the real next level of financing and the next level of credibility. And so then you say to yourself, okay, from Concord, I have this great little app 
and I'm going to present it and they're going to go, well, great. You know, you're from uh, Concord, Ontario in Canada somewhere and you say you're going to change it. So then comes the strategy, right? Which was, comes back to my sheet of the five key points or six or three, or whatever you feel you, you need to accomplish in the next 12 to 18 months as you start this company. And one of them for me, because as Phil, as you said, we're in Toronto and why Toronto is that luckily in the background, just imminently now in the last couple of years, we're, we're seeing Toronto becoming more and more respectful in the AI community and some of the other key software segments. But at the end of the day, any good startup and technology company needs some kind of strategic partner. So strategic partner could mean many different areas. Um, it could mean an investment from a strategic partner. It could mean an alliance from a strategic partner. It could mean a co-marketing from a strategic partner that has large credibility that has influence on, on, on the Valley, which elevates you now to a point where at least you're going to have an opportunity to call the largest companies in the world. And at least they're going to listen to you. And that was one of the things I did at MGI and obviously got Intel to invest. And ever since that happened, we had the greatest product and we still had the greatest companies in the world selling our product. But until that moment, all of a sudden, the world looked at us uh, quite differently in terms of yeah. acceptance. Good yeah. advice. Good advice. Uh, so here's a question I ask a lot of people. Okay. Um, this is what we, we all ask. Uh, so imagine there's a small tropical island just off Fiji that only has one phone booth where there's no internet. We drop you off there. You won't have a computer or a smartphone or a tablet. You can use the phone booth located there anytime to call the boat and we'll come pick you up. How long would you last before you made that call? And what would you do there while you were there? Uh, good, good question for survival. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think the first thing you'd end up doing is uh, for me is to say, okay, in other words, let me figure out how I can live here without, without using the phone. At the end of the day, that's the game here, right? Then comes the, the fact of, of analyzing, looking at the market. How do I live here? How do I, how do I do the day to day to begin with? And then uh, how do I get to a, another level, which means there is opportunity. It's an Island. I assume there's people on the Island or there's some kind of, a way of survival in terms of potential food. You're building your own island, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. But yeah, so I, I, I would say, um, again, it's, it's uh, not about panic. It's about being methodical, analyzing, um, and then um, executing. And, mm -hmm. and so um, it, I believe anything like that can be done. Uh, just yeah, a question sure. what's available. So... Just just one more final thing before we uh, call it a day here. Can you give us the top three things on your inspired life list that you would, you know, think would uh, be useful for other entrepreneurs, basically? Well, I think on, on the top list is, number one, the team and the people. It's so important to pick the right people and not to nickel dime yourself um, in getting to a point where you have to have the right individuals who are synced with you, who add value with you and are really, really team players. Uh, the, the one individual, no matter how entrepreneurial, no matter how visionary you are, no matter how strategic you are, it can't be done without a great team. So uh, that would be number one. And, and number two, is no matter how much you vet an idea and how great you think it is and how great you think this product is going to be to the world is to get feedback from the marketplace, get real feedback. In other words, real companies that you would normally have sold to understand uh, whether or not the acceptance is there. Three, you know, when you've got a few of these pieces happening is to set up your strategic positioning 
to go after financing, which at the end, at that point is really about saying, hey, I got a great idea, I got a great team, I got a product, I got feedback from, uh, from my customers, there's a big potential here, and then gather statistics that, that drive you know, that segment. And then when there's some bit of financing that happens, um, is to begin looking at how are you gonna leverage this technology to the industry? How do you get your name out to the industry? Which then comes to strategic partners, investment that helps you leap forward quickly. Because in this industry, time is of the essence and it's all about not being too early in a segment because you will end up grinding and grinding and spending money and patience runs out very quickly with investors if they don't see the significant traction. So timing is important to so make sure the market is there for you and that the timing's right. Um, and at the end of the day, bringing some of these pieces together and, and starting it. And, and the other important point, you know, which comes to my fourth point is be very focused. You might look at your software and say, well, I can go over here and I go over here and I go over here and you probably can't. But the reality is pick exactly where you're going to go and make sure you're a winner in that little segment and then start expanding and having your team disciplined to focus. Very important. Focus, focus, focus. That is fantastic, Andy. And thanks very much for joining us. If our listeners want to get a hold of you, uh, uh, is, is there uh, any way to do that? Or would you like them just to kind of get a hold of you through a Canvas podcast? Sure, they can, uh, they, they can uh, certainly email me anytime. Anthony D, as in David, at qnext.com. Perfect. Thank you once again, and um, thank you all for joining Canada's podcast. I think Anthony's uh, uh, life experiences as an entrepreneur have certainly uh, been, been fantastic to listen to. We'll talk to you Great. again soon.